Hi. Welcome everyone to another broadcast on medical cannabis. My intent is to really make this a program that people can keep tuning in on. In. The original program that I did was probably about 30 minutes, which gave you a general overview. And I want to dwell a little deeper in individual topics that I cover. This specific one is on history. So there's a couple of things I want to preface before I start. Um, first of all, I'm deeply humbled and uh, grateful for this uh, application to allow uh, Zubia to broadcast and just to allow um, me to have a platform. And the second thing is I wanted to talk about facts. So every, everything that I'm going to tell you is something you can go and Google and find out that it is really facts. Uh, no fake news here. Um, every once in a while, I may look down. I wrote down some dates. And I usually do this off the top of my head. I uh, kind of memorized most of it already. However, um, I want to make sure that I'm clear on certain dates. That way, I will know for a fact uh, that when you Google it, the information will be completely accurate. The second thing is, I want to make sure that I'm also able to um, I'm also able to respond to messages that keep going as I do the talk. So I do have uh, a, if I do not respond to your message, I will make sure that I do that when I uh, when I end the talk, and I'll get back to you on that. So a couple of things briefly. Cannabis has been used as medicine for over 10,000 years. Uh, it's been used as medicine in Asia, um, specifically China, some of the dynasties, and uh, some of the areas of India. We find it going back to the Sanskrit texts that were written. Um, and it's been used prevalently around the world primarily for as an analgesic, anti-inflammatory, cramps, a whole bunch of different uh, reasons it was used as medicine. But in the U.S., what happened? So in the U.S., it was used as regularly prescribed medicine for many years from about 1850 to as late as 1942. And it was prescribed uh, by doctors as medicine, and it grew freely, uh, even going back, just to give you a little bit more history, uh, it goes back to our forefathers. Our forefathers uh, cultivated hemp. If you think about uniforms, clothing, sails, uh, rope, anything else, uh, paper, which I'll get to in a little bit, all those things were made with hemp paper. So they grew uh, this product on their farms and uh, not only as medicine, but also uh, for recreational and industrial purposes. So going back to the question I asked, what really happened? Now, during World War I, the U.S. grew at least on a minimum 60,000 pounds annually. This was all grown specifically for pharmaceutical use. In the 1920s, all the way through the 30s, Eli Lilly, Park Davis, and some of these major pharmaceutical companies, they had tincture medicine that they created with cannabis, specifically for three different things, an analgesic, anti-inflammatory, antispasmatic for epilepsy and other things that create spasms, and as a sedative. So this was probably used uh, as medicine from the time that uh, our forefathers came here all the way through to World War I. Once again, what happened? Well, there's a couple of names that I think everyone should be aware of and give you some perspective. So in about 1930, a gentleman by the name of Harry Anslinger uh, became the commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Now, Harry Anslinger was uh, really big on trying to make a name for himself and uh, had a lot of political aspirations. He teamed up with, at that time, probably one of the top 10 richest men in the United States and possibly the world, 
uh, named William Randolph Hearst. For those of you who are in the California area may be familiar with Hearst Castle, but um, William Randolph Hearst's history goes back his his father made his money in gold and precious jewels and uh, William was uh, a newspaper guy so at that time newspapers had a tremendous amount of power and William Randall Hearst began publishing articles and began this campaign of publishing articles against cannabis now you may ask what is the motivation what is his intent his intent is several fold. So if you recall, I did mention uh, something specific about paper. So not only uh, were uniforms, clothing, robe sales made from hemp or cannabis, also, and, and as I was referring to medicine, also paper. So the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, among many, many other documents, were all written on hemp paper. William Randall Hearst had an incentive to make sure that paper is uh, created out of wood. And he teamed up with uh, Mr. DuPont and Mr. DuPont was producing chemicals that would turn wood into paper. That was one. The second reason, because you always need a motive, the second reason for that was that William Randall Hearst and DuPont also began developing synthetic fabrics, um, similar to polyester at that time. So hemp was used as clothing for many years uh, prior to cotton. So this was incentive to start creating, um, so start creating fabrics out of uh, chemicals from DuPont and William Randall Hearst. William Randall Hearst had a lot of power, not only in the newspaper industry, but also in general media. Uh, movies were very big at that time, and everybody went out, and, you know, it was a family outing if you could afford it to go to the movies. Uh, he financed the film. The film was called Reefer Madness. The Reefer Madness depicted um, Mexican farm workers and black jazz musicians medicating on cannabis and completely going insane to the point that they were making that a jazz musician uh, would medicate on cannabis and go out into your, uh, into your neighborhood and rape your white daughter or sexually molest or attack. Same thing with your Mexican farm workers. The word that he started using in his film and he started making prevalent in his publications was marijuana which sounded uh, Latin or Spanish sounding, Mexican sounding. So he moved away from the words hemp in a lexicon and cannabis to using marijuana. So just to fast forward, give you a little bit more of perspective. It started this avalanche of anti-cannabis, anti-marijuana, anti-hemp um, campaign. So, so, to the point that Congress passed in 1937, the Marijuana Tax Stamp Act. And in brief, what that does is it basically, since all the farmers or a lot of the farmers, uh, since this was the number one cash crop in the United States at that time in America, all the farmers, a lot of them grew hemp. So this tax would eventually tax up to 300% if you're grown hemp or cannabis and would incentivize farmers to grow corn financially. So if you convert your crop from hemp to corn, you will have an incentive. If not, you'll pay, um, you know, 300% tax. So that was the conversion process of trying to get the medicine um, from out of the farmers out of the United States and start creating synthetic medicine. That's when the pharmaceutical companies start jumping on board. However, the American Medical Association strongly, vehemently opposed that. All the way through the 40s, fighting until 1951, where the Boggs Act was passed. The Boggs Act gave a two-year minimum for possession of medical cannabis. 
And uh, this was, uh, you know, this was being fought, but uh, people were being extremely careful. And the uh, Pharmacopoeia uh, Association, American Medical Association, dropped cannabis as medicine in their uh, pharmacology uh, guidelines and, and books. In 1964, Dr. Uh, Raphael Mahalam was the first person to synthesize, an Israeli doctor, he's the first person to, to synthesize cannabis and discovered the different compounds, including THC, which actually makes, uh, gives you a psychoactive uh, effect. Shortly after, about 1968, the federal government signed an, an agreement with the University of Mississippi to cultivate medical cannabis. And it's interesting, just keep that in mind for future purposes, because that's a really interesting uh, reason why. Uh, 1970, Richard Nixon came to power, and he had <clears throat> some real personal issues against drugs. Not only drugs, but media-specific. So he was fighting the hippie culture at that time. There's plenty of recordings uh, recording him saying those things. And he control, uh, created the Controlled Substance Act. In the Controlled Substance Act, and you hear him talking about this, he said the liberal media... Uh, the pothead liberal media, they're using the pot. And what we're going to do is we're going to start locking them up because we're going to create a schedule of narcotics and we're going to put uh, dope, as he called it. We're going to put dope as a schedule one narcotic along with heroin and some of the other compounds uh, that currently uh, existed and basically say that it has no accepted medical use. However, after Richard Nixon uh, left the office, uh, the federal government was sued by a, name, a person named Robert Randolph. Robert Randolph sued the federal government for uh, allowing him to use medical cannabis uh, for his cancer. And the federal government created a program called IND. The IND program at the time uh, was, I think there was about 16 people, 14 to 16 people who got federally prescribed medical cannabis from the federal government grown and cultivated in the University of Mississippi and for medicinal purposes, even though it was a Schedule I narcotic, according to the federal government, had no accepted medical use. Um, fast forward in 1991, the federal government suspended the IND program and uh, California passed um, medical cannabis laws in 1996, which started as part of that. They also had a deal with the University of California, San Diego to start doing um, some medical trials, not clinical trials that they approved, medical trials on the benefits of cannabis. So uh, I'm running short on time and I want to answer some questions, but there's a couple of really important things. In 2003, the U.S. government filed a patent. It's actually the Health and Human Services filed a patent on medical therapeutic use of medical cannabis. The federal government holds a patent on medical cannabis. And it's still scheduled federally as a Schedule I narcotic. Today, fast forward, we have 29 states that have cannabis laws, some medicals and recreational, and plus the District of Columbia. Right now, what we see going on with the current administration is um, they're starting to, they're starting to uh, be on an offensive again in terms of trying to create civil forfeiture laws, trying to get back to the three-strike rule because our jails are filled with young uh, black and Latino uh, men because of the three strike rule that was imposed by various regimes. So basically you get caught for one thing, you get caught by a second thing, and then you get caught medicating on a medical cannabis cigarette and you have a 25 year sentence. That's a mandatory minimum. So I urge every single one of you to educate yourself, do some research, please help to make sure that this medicine gets to the people that need it. So the federal government and the pharmaceutical industry really stops the hypocrisy because they actually are using this substance as GW Pharma and many other uh, companies. Let's 
get together and work on trying to make sure that this medicine is available for every single person who actually needs it. Uh, I do have some questions, so let me just double check and see if I can answer those on the fly. Uh, yeah, so some of the questions are, is there a way that I can share the history? Uh, yes, I will share the history, absolutely. And I will provide any references to anything that I said. And if anybody has any questions about individuals that I mentioned on there too, uh, I will email every one of you and I get back to you on that. I believe that every single person on here can make a contribution. If there's a way that you can follow up with your senators, uh, Congress people, anybody else. But the main thing is just get educated. Uh, stop by earthhealthcare.com. That is the uh, website where you can get information on medical cannabis, earthhealthcare.com. Make sure you stop by, take a look. My email is on there. Contact me directly. And if you have anybody that actually has some uh, health issues, that's a great way for you to get um to get medical cannabis and educate yourself on medical cannabis. Thank you so much. Uh, there's plenty of resources out there. There's plenty of groups. There's a, I will send out links to every single person on there, but definitely check uh, the American Medical Association. And uh, once again, Earth Healthcare uh, as your primary source a reference point. Um, thank you so much. Oh, uh, somebody asked about lobbyists. Yes. There are several lobbyist groups uh, that are in D.C. and individual states. You can start with NORML, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. And there is a number of other organizations uh, that, you can, that you can contact. And I'll send links to each and every one of you. Thank you so much for your time. Truly humble and blessed. Uh, best of luck to everyone. Thank you. Take care.